Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin Dot Review podcast. This is an ad free pod. Thank you so much for streaming those ads. If you're a new listener, I'm NVK and I run CoinKite, where we've been helping people secure their Bitcoins for over a decade. We make products like the Code Card, the Block Clock, and we have a bunch of other projects. You can find more information on coinkite.com. This episode is going to be interesting. We have uh, a bright young fellow who have made caused a little bit of controversy in Bitcoin. And we have uh, a returning guest uh, who's uh, technical enough to understand all the shit. So uh, we, without further ado, uh, uh, welcome to the pod, Casey. Thank you, uh, NVK. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here and speak to your highly educated and worthwhile audience that you've been cultivating with your very, uh, you know, corporate Twitter and media <laughs> presence. I'm really interested in a technical and sophisticated topic where <laughs> our, our loathing of communism never comes up. <laughs> hey, uh, Rindell, thanks for coming back, Ben. I appreciate that. Yeah, th glad to be here. Um, I, I, I thought we were going to read the Sparrow release notes, but I guess we're talking about ordinals. Looking forward to it. I don't know. I would love to read the Sparrow re release notes to kick us off. Uh, Craig has been, Sparrow is our current recommendation for safely storing uh, inscriptions. And so I'm, he's in my DMs being like, bro, your degenerates are like blowing up my spot. Like, what do I tell them to do? So I actually think Sparrow release notes would be an amazing place to kick things off. You know, Craig is a, is a beast and, and a, fuck, what a super nice guy. Yeah. Yes. So guys, why don't we start with a quick primer? Because like, I think that the main problem, uh, it was also my confusion when I first heard about you know, there is there's this thing, the ordinals, there's this thing, the inscriptions. Actually, I think the boat has sailed. Nobody's going to ever know what the fucking inscriptions are. They're just going to call it ordinals. Yep. And uh, just like, okay, what's the elevator pitch if you had to have one for what are quote between quote ordinals? Yeah, so ordinals are, ordinal theory is a framework for viewing Bitcoin. And like many theories, it is uh, kind of, you know, uh, you know, proven, unproven, who knows? Some people believe it, like the theory of evolution, some people don't. And ultimately, it's your choice whether you believe in ordinal theory and at what times, and maybe you're a little fluid, and sometimes of the day you believe in ordinal theory and sometimes you don't. So it's basically a lens that you can look through when viewing the Bitcoin blockchain. And when you view it through that lens, the individual sats pop out into high definition and they become these things that you can track individually and they have a lot of character and structure and you can see when they were mined and you can track them across transactions. Bitcoin has a, has a model where the inputs to a transaction, the Bitcoin that you're spending is destroyed when, you, when, you, when, you, when that pr transaction is processed. And the outputs to that transaction are newly created and they have really no special relationship between the inputs and the outputs. The only rule is that the inputs and the outputs need to balance in terms of their values. So with ordinals, all of a sudden these sats pop into high definition and they become like Pokemon in the tall grass and you can chase them and collect them and transfer them and trade them and hold them in Bitcoin addresses. But we're just talking about the sats here. We're yeah, not the talking about the inscriptions yet. I just yeah, want to yeah, make yeah. it clear for people because yeah. that's where it starts getting confusing because people are used to the NFT crap. So it's a map for sats. Would you say that? Yeah, it's an index and then a protocol, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, an index or a map for sats, right? It's like these, these are sats for whatever arbitrary reason that you have, right? The ordinal theory is yours, but like for whatever arbitrary reason, you have a map or index of sats you're interested on. Yeah, and I don't want to confuse people, but heretical ordinal theorists have p begun to develop Slandero, which is the LIFO I think we should save that for the of ordinals. End. Maybe we should just table that for now, but alternate interpretations exist. There you yeah. go. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to the uh, to the Casey's conception ver fork of uh, ordinals. But um, yeah, I mean, like the, the way that I've, I've been explaining this to a few people is ordinals, non-inscription ordinals are 
a way to number Satoshis in this index. And the numbering is really straightforward. You say the first sat of the Genesis block is number zero, and then you just number them sequentially. And whenever a block is mined, the sats that are created in the Coinbase transaction just get numbered monatomically. And then whenever you do a Bitcoin transaction, you just take all of the numbered sats on the input and just drag them straight across to like the numbers on the output. And you know, in Bitcoin, the sum of the input value has to be greater than or equal to the sum of the output. If there's any excess, that gets burned to fees, and so those go to the miner. And like that's that's like ordinals on the back of a napkin. And if you think about it, if you think about um, colored coins, right? Like this is an analogy that I drew to somebody else. So like BISC, which is like a peer-to-peer exchange, they have their own colored coin called BSQ, and all that it is is an extra set of rules on top of Bitcoin. And like, if I'm running a piece of software that knows what BSQ is, and you're running a piece of software that knows what BSQ is, we can send each other these sats that the software tells us is this extra colored coin. It doesn't change anything about Bitcoin. Nobody else knows or cares. It's also not protected by Bitcoin. It's not protected by Bitcoin at all, right? It's like this extra set of consensus rules that our software takes like extra care of. And that's very much how ordinals is. Like if I'm running ordinal wallet and you're running an ordinal wallet, then we can both agree that I have sat number 6,340. The rest of the network has no idea that that's a thing. And another, like a a really interesting early kind of approach like this was a guy named Stefan Vogler, who I think is primarily an artist. And he came up with his own rules for issuing NFTs on Bitcoin, where he said, okay, this UTXO for issuing his art. I really don't like the term NFTs. It's overloaded, so I'll try to avoid it's it. It's terrible. Or he decided he wanted to let his collectors buy like a digital art object on Bitcoin. And he sort of nominated a UTXO and said, this contains the art. And he um, said, the, 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 the art will transfer, ownership of the, of the digital art object will transfer from the first input to the first output. Yeah. And he did this a long time ago. And this means that we've been talking and hashing it out and realizing that in a lot of cases, ordinal theory actually agrees with the Stefan Vogler algorithm, right? And so they, you can, inscriptions can travel or ordinals can travel along the same path as a Stefan Vogler face. So there's many different ways to do that. I'm not the first, I'm not even the first to think of this particular way of doing it. Right. So I think it's important for people to understand, you know, through this long, wide road, mm-hmm. why like ordinals are essentially like unrelated to Bitcoin I mean, you know, it's how mm-hmm. you're finding your sats, but, you know, it's it's like it's a thing. It's a map outside of Bitcoin. It's not protected by Bitcoin. It has nothing to do with, like, how the chain works. None of that. It doesn't change fungibility. It doesn't break coin joins. None of that. Exactly. Yeah, users have been helping out with these little gifts for how they explain the protocol and think about the protocol to each other. And one of those gifts was the idea that it's a lens, you know? Yes. Mm. You know, it's like it's like polarized glasses that you put on and all of a sudden you see these extra reflect, reflections. And like maybe they're you there, know, maybe they're not. Uh, th- there is people who like really like, you know, dollar bills with specific serial numbers, right? Like it does not yep. change the fungibility of the US dollar. Exactly it does not right. like affect anything. And the Federal Reserve does not care if you do uh, a serial number uh, preference or non-preference, right? It's, it's maybe even a little bit even more indirect than that. It's like the, the, the serial numbers aren't even on the bills. Yeah. They're on some other right. database somewhere else. Every like, third bill is incredible to you for whatever reason. Or, or it would be like, imagine, imagine you could observe the money coming out of the U.S. Mint and you could like count every bill and you maintained your own index. And you're like, that one is number 4,363. Yeah. And like, as long as everybody's running software that comes yeah. to lowercase c consensus yeah. on the state of that index, yeah. you can say like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. like the one that ends the number four. And then, and then somebody, and then somebody goes like, Hey, you like, you stand outside the mint all day with a clipboard. Like, do you work for the mint? And then you're like, no, I'm a fucking <laughs> lunatic who just does this for fun. I'm an ordinal theorist. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ordinal theorists developing their U.S. dollar-based ordinal theory and hanging outside the mint with clipboards is strongly you know, so incurred. sort of like a you know a backhanded compliment is almost like astrology for sats. I've said that many times. This is like astrology for men. I would say it's like astrology for men, but the women are getting into it too. So it's kind of just astrology for weirdos. Yeah. Okay. 
you know, keep it weird is not a bad thing. I mean, that's how internet was built. Okay, so this is the first part, right? This is this is the astrology sure. part of this. This is how we how we want to look at this stuff. This is truly freedom part of of this, right? It has no no externalities, nothing. Yeah, and and and, and like before before we move on to the next part, it has zero on chain footprint. It has like no externalities. The thing that I so when, when Casey first sent a BIP to the Bitcoin dev mailing list saying, hey, I've come up with this ordinal theory thing, I read that and thought that he was trying to like break fungibility. And that I'm was like, my first impression. That was my first impression. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, yeah, because yeah. that mailing list has a lot of fucking cranks, right? Yeah. But then he, like, there was another blog post that came out and, and he talked about, you know, oh, well, you can add these, you know, numbering schemes that make them collectible. And the thing that kind of clicked in my head was, okay... I like Bitcoin, people like collecting things. It would make sense that somebody would want to try to collect a sat from all the notable exchange hacks or collect a sat from all the happenings or collect a sat from various like geopolitical events where Bitcoin it, 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 like lets you collect collectible Bitcoin. So if, if you have that picture in your head, I think you understand kind of base layer sats and then inscriptions are another thing on top of it. You know, uh, being in Bitcoin for this long, like I have a lot of friends who are collectors. <laughs> There's a lot of Bitcoin. Bitcoiners yeah. really, Bitcoin really attracts collectors. And I have like zero instinct to collect anything, right? So I always, I, I look at Same. this as more like, a, it's like going to the zoo or anthropological experiments. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's funny to see the oh. animals having fun, but like, I can't comprehend. I don't speak the same language. But anyways, so, so that was the, the ordinal stuff that unrelated to Bitcoin yep. part. Now the part that matters, right? Inscriptions. You know, inscriptions do affect Bitcoin. They are essentially putting data in the witness of Taproot. And then we're going to sort of like get into all this. But, you know, unlike other monkey JPEGs on the other chain, our monkeys are now in Bitcoin, right? Like, and, and, and they get in there once. So at least there is no transferring them around. So it's not like you're, you're passing the data mm -hmm. around. But... You know, and that has many consequences. So why don't you explain to us like your implementation of this, right? So, and we can get a little bit in the weeds here too, because we can discuss the whole like witness tobacco and, and sort of like the yep. the limit on top yep. scripts and all that shit. But yep. uh, yeah, yep. give us like a little bit of preamble here and, and sort of like how it was implemented. Yeah, I guess I also, I want to very briefly touch on why I did it. Um, I, like you, do not really have a collector's mentality. I don't really collect things. I, I, I've never been into, well, I mean, when I was a kid, like trading cards and magic cards and stuff. So yeah, I don't know, maybe I get it a little bit, but I, I saw a market develop for a certain kind of um, algorithmic art that I make. And that I was like, okay, that'd be awesome if I could make and sell digital art objects, but I couldn't do that on the existing, through the existing mechanisms for doing that for a lot of technical reasons. And so that's why I, I I made inscriptions. And so you were shit coining, right? Like on Ethereum, trying to stick it in there. No, no. that was no. Okay, because I've because I, you've 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 sort of you got a lot of ideas and sort of like you participated like in. Oh, I didn't okay, participate. Okay, so you, you, nothing related to the the shit coin NFTs, none of that. No, no, no. I mean, I I did not. I realized that I could make a lot of money, and I realized that there were collectors out there who were sophisticated and who knew what they were buying. And I started looking into the tech of Ethereum and saying, like, okay, could I do this? And I even wrote a single Solidity contract that I think I never deployed or deployed on testnet. And I was just so overwhelmed by the shittiness of it, yep. uh, like that it's like this fractal of very bad decisions, um, yes. where if you, at every level, there are bad decisions. If you zoom out, there are bad decisions about the larger direction of the of the protocol. And when you zoom in, there are bad decisions about the, the specs and everything. And so I decided that I just couldn't encourage this, you know? And also for me as a, let's say, technical artist, it was very frustrating to work with, that the tools were very bad and everything was very not user-friendly and you had to go through all these hoops and it was just unnecessarily complex. And so I decided, I actually decided to make inscriptions, essentially decided to make digital, tradable digital art objects or digital artifacts 
before I started working on ordinals. In early 2022, I started noodling on how I could do digital art on Bitcoin. And I initially came up, it was called Atoms, and it was weird, and there was one per block, and it followed this weird UTXO model, and maybe you were going to have to grind the hash of transactions to transfer it in particular ways. It was mega weird. And then I sort of um, started stripping away degrees of freedom from it and removing mm. things that felt arbitrary. And one thing, Bitcoin has no consensus over ordinals, but it has these rules that are kind of close to being consensus over ordinals, which is what Reindahl mentioned that each transaction has to balance. Mm -hmm. Each Bitcoin transaction is like a scale and the outputs are on one side and the inputs are on the other. And when the, when, the, when the outputs are heavier than the inputs, the transaction is invalid, right? And then when the, when, the, when, the, when the outputs are balanced, when you include the fees, it's valid. So it kind of has this already this property of conserving It's basic stats. accounting, you know? Like if you want to balance your mm -hmm. bank account, that's how Bitcoin works. There's no credit in Bitcoin, right? Just to translate this yep. to the economic yep. people here. <laughs> yep. You know? Yep. The inputs come in, they have to balance out. Like it's either going to somebody else or back to US change. It has to go somewhere, right? And there is nothing new being created in a single transaction. Well, the, there is a way that uh, SATs can leave the system, which is if the miner underpays the block reward. And because I had to deal with what happens in that case, I had to think about that. But yeah, NVK, you're completely right. Like that's, yeah, that's how Bitcoin works. And so I realized that once I started leaning very heavily on that property, one is like degrees of freedom started to be stripped away. I was like, okay, like whatever, like I'm not going to worry. Like I can, I can not do that. And then I don't have to make a choice there. And I, I actually kind of at this point, pretty, I'm honestly convinced maybe somebody can show me otherwise that this is the most elegant way of doing a, a sort of a colored coin system on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I've had a bunch of people, you know, for example, like this thing where this artist, like, like, I don't know how many years ago, but a long time ago, came up with something that in some ways agrees with mine in, in certain, in certain avenues is like kind of in, indicates this kind of like universality of it. So I kind of joke sometimes that I didn't create ordinal theory. I just discovered it. And it was a case of independent invention because there's a 2012 Bitcoin talk forum post where somebody So it was not Craig Wright. <laughs> no, no. Unless Jonathan Lau or Johnson Lau, I always forget his name. I am sorry, bro. You are a legend. Unless he is not telling us something. No, it was, it was Johnson Lau. And, and also when I saw that blog post, the, the reason that I hadn't seen that blog post for a while, because I didn't know what it was. And then when I finally finished it, I thought, oh, this is like serial numbers for sats. And I, then I had the phrase and then I typed it into Google. And then that was the title of the forum post. It came up as the first result immediately. I was, I was, I was, uh, I was in San Francisco, like near the ferry building. And it was just like, oh shit. So I joke, but in a way I'm kind of serious that I did not create ordinal theory, that maybe I discovered it and that it was a case of independent discovery, that it's something that exists there in the contours of the code. And then once you get there, it's very easy. So people think that I created ordinals and then I created inscriptions, but my goal was always tradable digital art objects. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I had always planned that ordinals would be a vehicle for inscriptions. And I was going to figure out inscriptions once I got there and I didn't need to figure out the specifics. So after I had sort of developed ordinals kind of in its complete form, it's like t-shirt spec level simple. Then I started looking at, well, okay, I want to, I, there are a lot of problems with putting data off chain. There is a small, there are, there are on chain communities and other ecosystems that do really great work. And I knew that collectors really valued that. And I really want to say that I'm really informed at all times by the great work that's being done in art in these other communities, that there, there's like, there's great art, not like, you know, the huge generic things, but the, the real core of really interesting stuff. I think that's all subjective. I mean, I am a huge fan of like the completely absurd and offensive memes. Oh, I those, find those are the, some of the best. I find those things to be like the best representation society that we have. Like it's like one image just yeah. like poof encompasses everything. Yeah. But anyways. Yeah. So yeah. So then I started saying, okay, well, I need to stick arbitrary Bitcoin data in the Bitcoin blockchain. So, you know, the thing that's become very controversial. And I started looking at where to put it. And let's go forward in time. 
about the Bitcoin upgrades that would have changed this. And Reindahl, let's go from day one. So day one, Satoshi client ordinals is possible. Day one, it's all there. And day one, I think actually there were some not, there were some, the, the one megabyte limit was not there. Bitcoin, you mean? Yeah. No, Bitcoin was 32 megabytes when it started. Uh, and then Satoshi very quickly, without any questions or discussions, dropped to one megabyte, if I remember right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He probably did the napkin math and it was like, ooh, it seems like a lot of hard drives. Yeah, I mean, especially in those days, you would not have fit in hard drives within like the year. Yeah. Yeah. So day one, ordinals is possible on the Satoshi, original Satoshi client. And I think you could have done a output script, a script, a script pub key, which mm -hmm. would have committed to a hash and forced you to reveal it on chain. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's another thing, too. There was no uh, restriction on op return, too, on the very beginning. Uh, the restriction, the, the limit on op return came after, which was also like very contentious. So that's actually an incredibly clean way of saying it, that if I had looked at it then and I had not cared about polluting the UTXO set, which is something that I had come to care deeply about at this point. But if I was a new cypherpunks mailing list guy and I had just shown up, that's what, what I might have done. I might have said, all right, well, actually, no, I actually would not have done it. I would not have done it because one of the key design principles or or whatever of, of this of this stuff is to be orthogonal to Bitcoin, but to leverage the existing functionality wherever possible. And there's a problem with op returns that they um, they don't sort of they're not really associated with an output that has sats that can move. Yeah, like one of the things that's kind of interesting about putting data on the input side is if you have a mechanism for tracking individual items, if you have this like lens, then you can walk backwards through the transaction graph. And it will, you know, kind of bottom out at a data blob. And I, I've seen other people before try to build protocols on top of um, op returns, and they end up doing something weird, like they put um, transfer instructions inside of an op return, or they like designate which output it should be associated with, and it, it just makes the system like really, really complicated because you're effectively tying a transfer to a sibling output instead of it using the natural like input output order well, it's not part of the it's not part of the utxo right it's part of the transaction it doesn't follow with the the sat mm -hmm. exactly yep. so yeah day one uh ordinals on satoshi client and like crappy hack i i actually wouldn't even need to use an op return right i could just do the data and uh like a like a push data like a third like a 32 meg push data in there mm -hmm. And uh, that would have been, that's like kind of an interesting design. And Andrew Polstra on the mailing list was like, yeah, maybe we should uh, turn op return into a free for all because the, you know, the wheels have come off the wagon. I still personally, I still don't like the, the op return. I find that to be sort of like very sort of arbitrary thing. It's, it's, it's almost like, yeah. it's like putting uh, uh, like a, an extra like trunk inside a dollar bill or something you know i'm trying to send a dollar bill like why am i adding like this compartment to put arbitrary crap that's unrelated to money right inside there yeah. i i rather like yeah. if we're gonna do this then this should be a transaction uh it should be like an actual money transaction script uh, it should be part of the script yep yeah really the best design is that you also for other reasons because sometimes you want to commit to things before revealing them that you do a hash commitment that that is the output and then you reveal it <clears throat> by spending from that output you could do things where you commit to a inscription the content of an inscription years in advance and then reveal it in just a ma massive like chad gigabrain move where you're like i saw it coming all along and here's proof um so that's another very nice aspect of the design so man yeah maybe um next step is um pay to script hash right do this with pay to script hash right you commit to a script a script hash and then you reveal that script and the script contains a bunch of contains all the data you want to <clears throat> you want to reveal in this case well, you can write whatever you want in the script yep there yeah, is yep, no yep. Uh, uh, and I, I believe there is no limit either because there's no discount so you can make it as big as you want there's well there's the standardness rules which are a big hiccup yeah but there is no in the protocol itself there is no limit yeah, and, and, and like we'll probably talk more about standardness rules in a few minutes, right? But like standardness rules will prevent transactions from being relayed, right? Right. Like you, you won't put them in your mempool, but if you hand it to a miner, it's still yeah. a consensus. 
And also something that I didn't realize when I saw the demand for this, I, I knew that it was going to be inscriptions and ordinals were like really cool and I really believed in them, but the speed at which they would be adopted or if they would be adopted was a mystery to me. Yeah. And one thing that I'm realizing is that so many people want this, that any policy, any relay policy, which tries to keep things, things out of the mempool, it's fully doomed. So then I created, then, then yeah, so you could do scrape, pay to script hash, but you wouldn't get the discount and kind of... Uh, negatively, a subtle thing is then it would be co covered, that data would be covered by the reveal transaction hash, which means that you kind of can't zero out those bytes or stop storing out those bytes without possibly, yeah, you can't, prune it. Yeah. can't prune it, can't prune it. Yeah. So, and then, by the way, um, uh, B2SH you, was also a massive fight on Bitcoin. Like, do, it almost didn't happen. And it was also terrible yep. of doing shit anyway. So, <laughs> I also, that's what I hear is that there's like some alternative way of doing P2SH that was maybe smarter, but we, we didn't have sort of the technical review and discussion. I think it was op eval. Yeah, something like that. No, no, op eval uh, had a recursive bug or something. And that's why it was not, it was not uh, going, going to that one. Right. That was probably a Gavin boo-boo again. <laughs> it was, yeah. It sounds like a Gavin boo-boo. So the thing is, like, through Bitcoin's history, like, every single new sort of primitive has always had, like, a lot of contention because, you know, it's hard to know where the bugs are going to be and, you know, where the, like, the mistakes are going to be and, and, uh, and also, like, it's hard to prove the use case and all that shit. But anyways, sorry. So so then it got us to to here, right? Like, you could have done on the witness yep. of a standard big... Yeah. Well, well, let's let's just go really step by step. So could have done a pay to script hash. When I was looking at that in the present day, that had standardness rules, which made it messy. Then we get um, SegWit, right? Yep. And SegWit, the key is that it moves this, this signature, signature, it moves signatures and scripts out of the transaction body in this very elegant way. Because in a way, you know, you have this transaction that is like covered by this hash and separately you have this thing that can authorize a transaction. In many ways, creating that is like, you know, you, you know, somebody with a key can do that many different ways to authorize that transaction. And so you move it out of the, move it out of the transaction, which helps with transaction malle malleability. And at the time that this was implemented, this was SegWit, it was seen as desirable to have a block size increase. <laughs> That's when it gets complicated. NVK, <laughs> yeah, NVK, later I want to talk with you about, on this pod, I want to talk to you about how we can turn Bitcoin into bunk bunker coin with uh, monkey JPEGs. We're going to get there. But yeah, so like SegWit, okay, there we go. But I think I don't fully remember what I was thinking. This was like a, this was like a four hour or a couple hour thing where I was reading blog posts and technical docs about standardness rules. And a lot of that has poured out of my brain and it's a lot of work to scoop it back in. So like I knew that there were all these standardness rules that would make this very tricky. Like you had size limits, you had X, Y, Z limits. Um, and I think over time, the appetite for these kind of little limits in the protocol, the appetite for that has diminished. You know, we want Bitcoin to be very simple. We want to have limited exceptions we want to do things when it makes sense and we don't want to add random rules. Well, so I believe it's like... The idea is, is it's either part of consensus, right? Or you try not to rule it yeah. because you don't know how people are going to use it. I think yeah. that's, if we have to talk about sort of like without taking the drama out, that, that's sort of like the main motivation on, on this as, as I understand. It also means that Bitcoin core devs don't have to talk about policy. That's right. I mean, look at what happened to RBF. Yeah, so there's the whole RBF thing and like that'll be interesting to get into. Um, <laughs> when we're talking about policy and whether or not people start changing their mempool policy. But an another thing to keep in mind with Taproot removing a bunch of limits is part of what we want to be able to do with Taproot is have things like really composable mini script scripts to stick down in tap leaves. And so the, the thing that's really cool about MAST, about you know having a tree of scripts and only revealing the one that you want, is that you could have a tap leaf that's really big and really complicated, and most of the time you don't use it. But like, if you need it to met, to move your money, you can. Yep. And so, um, you know, th there are still some limits in Taproot, but a lot of them are around um, validation cost and less around just pure script size. So, you know, I, I am fully convinced that if somebody really wanted to, they could make you know inscriptions out of pre-Taproot SegWit. 
they would just need a couple more for loops and the encoding and decoding logic would be a little bit more complicated because they'd have to work around some limits. Yep. But um, yeah, like the- The cat is out of the bag. The cat's out of the bag and there's good reasons why these limits got lifted. Yeah. So, okay. So Casey, so walk us through now. I think now it's the time where you go like, aha. So then I was like, okay, well, I've, I've got this ordinals thing and I want to assign- I want to assign art to ordinals and, and you can assign anything. And so I had this idea that I wanted to leverage existing standards. And so the data model of an inscription is the data model of an HTTP response. When, it, when you ask a server for a piece of content, it responds with the body, which you would say is kind of like the file, you know, it's the actual bytes. But then it also responds with a content type, also known as a mime type. And a content type or mime type is a description of what those bytes mean. So is it text slash plain? Is it image slash PNG? Is it image slash JPEG? And there's a rich language of these text strings to talk about different content types. So that was what I wanted to put in somewhere. I wanted to put in a representation of a HTTP response, because then I knew that when I ran up a, when I spun up a HTTP server, I could actually kind of delegate to the inscriber for how the server was going to serve this response, right? It's just, you know, yeah, here's the type that they say it is, and here are those bytes. So that's basic MIME types. Yep. And I think the, I think the, um, but zooming out a little bit, I needed a place to push, put a bunch of data pushes, right? A bunch of pushes of bytes. And so I wanted to make this not change the semantics of the script. And so I put it in, so the, the, I call this an envelope. And an envelope is a op if, or sorry, an op false, op if, and a bunch of data pushes, and then an op end if. And I want to kind of dwell here for a second because if you are a Bitcoin user and you want to think about how people are using the network and you don't like inscriptions or ordinals or they freak you out, or, hey, maybe you just don't want to think about them too hard right now, the best shorthand for understanding what they are is an op false, op if, a bunch of data pushes, and an op end if. And this is just, you're seeing these transactions and they just have big envelopes with this data. And this makes them, you know, basically as close to possible as ignored by... But that's how old nodes see SegWit. Mm -hmm. Well, to be very clear, old nodes ignore the witness. Yes. And SegWit nodes in ignore the envelope. Right. So, yeah. So then, then that's the basic idea. That's the, that's the construct that I came up with is this envelope construct. And then I started working out now that, that now a separate level is now there's, um, there are protocols within the envelope. And the first data push in an envelope is a protocol identifier, which identifies what the envelope is for. Um, envelopes, my use of envelopes in inscriptions is a public, it's a public system. It's a system of record. And so privacy in many cases is a non-goal or is a subtle goal. Um, so the envelope has a protocol identifier. So non-private Uses of envelopes, should ideally identify them with a unique string? I'll probably have to make a registry for that. There's been a lot of interest. Um, and But ORD uses the um, protocol identifier, the ASCII string ORD. And this tells you that it is made by ORD. Um, I might kind of draw the line that actually the ORD, you know, you should, if you want to, if you, well, eh, politics, whatever. But yeah, so first thing is the protocol identifier ORD. That tells you that the only ORD protocol message is a inscription. And it's actually like an inscription reveal. And so then you have a data pushes that encode the, um, this HTTP response, essentially. And so first you have headers. And the first header is the content type. I think that's actually the only header that is produced by ORD. And then you have a op zero, like an empty push, an op false, another op false after this content type. That's this content type header. It's like a uh, header name, header value. And then you have this empty push. And that identifies that you're done with headers and that you're going to get the body next. And then you just read and concatenate data pushes until you reach the end of the envelope. And that is the HTTP response body. 
So if you go to ordinals.com slash content slash some inscription ID, that's what the server is returning to you. It does a bunch of weird shit with other headers that have mm. to do with content security and, and sandboxing. Um, but right. ultimately, that's it. You, you that's say, pretty cool. Yeah, you, you as an inscriber say what HTTP response you want an ORD server to respond with. Um, and that's, that's the idea. This is, ironically, absurdly censorship resistant. Yeah. Like, no, I, I mean, like, the irony here is not lost, man. Like, well, and, 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 and there, there's been a bunch of people who have noticed that the envelope is actually a really generic type. And, you know, maybe the thing that I, I really want to do is back up an encrypted copy of my wallet descriptors and, like, stick them into um, a witness with a different you know, type ID in, in that first data push and like make it so that it's something that I can find or something else. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a very censorship resistant mechanism to publish arbitrary blobs of data 520 bytes at a time. And also one thing that I might consider doing in the future is right now, the header names are, are just integers. And this sort of depends. Like one thing that's nice about it being an integer is like, well, if they were strings, then you could put whatever headers you wanted in an inscription. Um, and for secu secu security reasons, those will never be returned by the server. Hmm. But actually, there, there are certain cases where I have made myself a gatekeeper and other cases where I very carefully not made myself a gatekeeper. So one way that I have not made myself a gatekeeper is that we use content types. And content types are strings, and users can kind of make up their own. They're in encouraged hmm. to follow existing standards. But I've been very sensitive that you don't want to add protocol-level arbitrary metadata because it makes people think it means something. I, I love that. It's responsible. <laughs> yeah, it's responsible. And obviously people can do whatever they want. They will fall out of social consensus with uh, People can't write software, so uh, you don't have to worry too much. I like to call this social consensus. Like people go to ordinals.com and to a lot of people, those are the inscriptions. And that's my version of ORD that I run with my own moderation policy. And if they do random things, they'll fall out of social consensus with, with me. Like which inscriptions exist and what features they have. But content type... Con header, con uh, sorry, header names in the header names in an inscription are integers, which means that in order to come up with a new one, if you pick a low integer, there's a really good chance you're going to conflict with something that I do in the future. And so maybe what you should do first is you should create a GitHub issue and we should figure out if this is actually solved best by a new envelope header. And that will help people understand some of the concerns and considerations. I, I, I think one of the best things that I can do is respond to GitHub issues that people have and say, hey, like, I know you want to use this as for this, for this use case. Um, maybe you think that this feature is a good idea and this, this header is the way to do it. But um, I don't. And here's why. And here's why, you know, Ord is not going to support that. And you can do what you want if you're comfortable with falling out of social consensus with me. But, um, you know, that's your prerogative. Now, that's been, um, that's been a really good choice of being a gatekeeper in that way. Not being a gatekeeper of MIME types, of the actual content type strings, has been a great way. Like, people have, Reindahl can possibly speak to this, I do not know, where people have made illicit inscriptions of unsupported content types and yeah, I, I definitely put some JavaScript um, inscriptions in, and was disappointed that the uh, that Casey had sandboxed the uh, the viewer. Yeah, and then so this, but then I, I so I've been this has been informing how I prioritize adding um, content types to the ordinals.com front end to, to Ord. You, when you run Ord, it has a server. So oftentimes somebody like, why do we have PDF inscriptions? Well, the reason we have PDF inscriptions is somebody inscribed the Bitcoin white paper. I thought that was really cool. They used, you know, application slash PDF. And I actually had to do some complicated work to enable that in the front end. You can't sandbox mm -hmm. PDFs in Chrome because it's a plugin and you can't run plugins in a iframe sandbox. I found a suitable JavaScript library that renders PDFs. I wrote a very simple like eight line renderer that would render the first page of a PDF. And now we have a, a Bitcoin white paper inscription very, very early. Um, there's a lot of incredibly subtle considerations in how the front end supports um, different inscription types and the choices we make um, because inscriptions are permanent. And I want people to understand that if they 
they do anything that doesn't appear correctly on ordinals.com, that's on them. And they need to be comfortable with that never rendering correctly ever. If, if I'm not able to support it in a way that supports the way that they did that. But they could render it themselves, right? They could create a website that points to that specific or their own wallet or anything they want. Yeah, yeah. Like so, this is this is the beauty of this, right? Like I am certain that what we're going to end up seeing is like people essentially leveraging what you built, and you know, like doing all kinds of crap that you may not agree with, or I don't like it, or whatever. And they're going to just render like however they want, because the yep. key here is that if the data is like whole, right? Mm -hmm. Like the data is not broken. Uh, I mean, rendering is a problem for, you know, for later for the client. But let me say, uh, it's my problem, right? Uh, I want to keep people in social consensus around which inscriptions exist, what numbers they have, um, what the what content types exist. If there's two people who want to buy and sell an inscription, and one of them is using ordinals.com, and one of them is using, you know, ordinals.foobar.com, and it's somebody else's thing, um, there is consensus. It's very similar to... Um, you know, who, what UTXOs exist. No, I get that, but that's not Bitcoin, right? Like, I, Bitcoin well, does not I just enforce... want to emphasize this. Oh, no, no, this no, is I something I'm trying to that. get yeah. out so that people know that they are yeah. free to do what they want, but a lot of people might not agree with that. And that's well, one thing that I like about the social consensus is it's not yeah. a hard global consensus. Uh, that's what I'm saying. People fork it and try to use, you know, with some other... Like either yep. the same number theory, but like maybe they're going to try to do something else. And because this is censorship resistant and because this is building on like Bitcoin's like very strong primitives and security, like there is nothing Casey can do. Well, there are things I can do. I'll put it a different way, right? So if if people are trading digital collectibles on the system, if the economic majority of people who are trading digital artifacts using a ordinal like system use a ordinals.com compatible viewer mm -hmm. then whatever yeah. shows up there is the consensus of what inscriptions exist if nvk goes and makes brb.ordinals or ordinals.brb.io right and decides that he's going to interpret everything through some crazy filter and it's just like him and five other people using it they can do that, but if they go out into like the broader market and say, look at this crazy thing that I have, like nobody's going to agree with them because they're all using a different viewer, right? right. It's mm -hmm. it's very much the the same way that, you know, forks happen in other distributed leaderless consensus systems. Oh, but that's what I'm saying, right? Like I can see people who are maybe not interested in the collection part mm -hmm. uh, be interested in maybe how your framework for having content on chain, well, right? Maybe doing some of that. Let me let me say that I actually got a GitHub issue from somebody who wanted to um, I wanted somebody who wanted to explore the publishing use case hmm. and not transfer things, which I think is a great use case. Um, but I think the best way to accomplish that is actually to figure out what features can be added to inscriptions to do that use case. Because if you do something else, it's not going to be returned by the ordinals.com website or anybody who's running the compatible software. And so I think people have this idea that they think like let a thousand protocols bloom, but I have the, uh, the CCP original intention of that, which is like, no, if, if, you, if you do things that are weird and I can't support, I'm just gonna try to add those use cases to ORD mm -hmm. to support them. So for example, like one way that could be supported is creating an inscription that you indicate somehow is not transferable, right? It's just an extra field, right? That says, you know, hey, like it's, it's just not meaningful to transfer this inscription. It's one and done, right? And then it shows up on the ordinals. When you go to ordinals.com slash inscription slash whatever, you don't see the current sat point. You don't see anything related to transferring. You don't see an address that owns it, right? And this makes very clear, this is an inscription but it is a non-transferable or it's not even ownable in the first place. So maybe even you just see the address that originally published it and that address never changes. Right. But this is all social layer stuff. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the social layer like rules everything. No, I, I get it. Yeah. Like, Bitcoin is whatever the people who are at the The social at the consensus, time. like Bitcoin, me and you passing a open dime between each other in a dingy bar 
in the wrong side of town is based on social consensus. Yeah, no. So, so like, and it goes further than that. I had this discussion on the Op Vault episode. You know, realistically speaking, it, you know, in in if a hundred years from now, say like we're all dead, right? There is a new group of 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 like people who who are champions, developers, miners, and whatever the world is. You know, they might want to change features on Bitcoin in a different direction, right? I mean. Uh, ideally not. Ideally, we we create the best way we can to to pass on the ball with uh, with a specific vision and a specific way of doing things, and hopefully that creates the enough Lindy that nobody does anything else. You know, inertia is your best protector. That's how the fiat system protects itself is with inertia. The people layer matters matters because it's the humans who are using the system, <laughs> and it's the humans who who can change things. And then they have to agree that, you know, the new trade-offs are okay or not okay. It sucks for the people who think that, you know, things are written in stone. Uh, humans change their minds a lot. So anyways, why don't I take a quick tangent here and explain how I coped hard first with this. See, then cope has been out of control. That's right. What's the first stage of Ordinal's acceptance? Is it seethe or is it cope? It's seethe first. I think it's seethe. Did you seethe first? A little bit, yeah. So, so like first, I was like, I was like, okay, what the fuck, <laughs> right? Like, is this an attack, right? That, that, that's like Bitcoin. that is the correct Bitcoiner mindset, in my opinion, right? The first thing is, what the fuck is it an attack? What do I do to stop the attack, right? Like, so I saw this, and I'm like, okay, so asshole, <laughs> it, it, you know, like it's not the first time NVK has called me an asshole. Right? I, so, I lost count after a little while. So, so they are like polluting the polluting the the chain, and I'm like, oh, but hang on a second, right? So I start looking technically what's going on here, right? Yep. And I'm like, oh, okay. So he's not like doing some funny shit and sort of like you know storing some data here, some data there, and trying to like gobble everything together somewhere else, and you know doing non cohesive things or just sort of taking up space, right? I'm like, okay. So what he's doing is he's having valid. Taproot scripts, <laughs> right? Like you're like somebody using Taproot. This is a strong positive signal. Exactly right. So so that was my first cope, right? I'm like, okay, so he's using valid Taproot scripts, right? Okay, that's fair. I don't like it, but it's fair. And then I was like, okay, hang on a second. You know, Taproot scripts don't have a limit, and they have a discount. So I go back to asshole. Back to Steve. <laughs> back to Steve a little bit, and then I'm like, but hang on a second, right? The original sin here is making Bitcoin four times bigger blocks, which I didn't want, but everybody was okay with it. Most people got bamboozled into it. So, you know, I've always been a believer that, you know, whatever the block size is, it's going to be full at all times, yep. right? Yep. If we have like correct usage. usage and number, the more the number go up, which is the thing that defends Bitcoin, the more the blocks are going to continue to be full. Block, blocks should be full. They should be 300 kilobytes and it's a different discussion. But We'll uh, get there. But, yeah, but they should be full, yeah, we'll get there. right? That's it. Like the blocks are full. Now, you know, you can get into arguments about the witness discount, no Windows discount, but it doesn't matter, right? Because we could make it so that every wallet only does taproot scripts and none of them have to pay the old full fee. We can make it so mm -hmm. that every single transaction in Bitcoin is a discounted transaction. Yep. It's not hard to do that, right? It's just an adoption of taproot. So that sort of negates all my, my criticisms to it, right? And then I was like, oh, but hang on a second, he's going to make sats non-fungible asshole right like <laughs> and then I'm like no hang on a second no they are not right like this is not has nothing to do with bitcoin like i go back to the dollar analogy thing you know people mm -hmm. can transact that okay so now it's like i go back to like you know the ethics of it like are we like as somebody put it i can't remember who was it sort of like spray painting the porous walls of the cathedral i'm like you know what like there is people doing worse shit with transaction with monetary transactions on bitcoin right doing shit that i really 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 dislike so ah so so like essentially like i mean i don't see the main problem with this the attacks are none of the ones that like i, I can see how people don't like it yeah but not liking it does not make it incorrect wrong it doesn't make it ethically superior or not superior i couldn't find a place in which this is bad. And one, like, there's a few byproducts of this that are actually kind of great. I think, like, the majority of the people in this space that 
say they wanted Segwit, did not have a fucking clue what Segwit is. The majority of the people who who wanted the the blocks to go in a certain direction did not understand it was going to be bigger. There's a lot more discussion about maybe making the blocks smaller. I know it's not going to happen, but a man can dream. And then there, there is more. Like, I mean, you know, there's all the FUD with, like, security budget crap, you know, like the tail emission crap. No, hey, blocks are full now. So more money to the miners. Not that it makes any economic difference right now because yep. we're in a low-fee environment. And then there's the other criticism. Sorry, guys. I'm just going to rant for a little while here. Yeah, yeah go for it. Do it, man. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a few more when you're done, for sure. Yeah. So, so then, like, I was like, okay, hang on a second, right? Like, transaction, and this is going to get into the conversation that me and Casey almost pissed ourselves drinking. You know, like, you have this pool, right? Each block, unconfirmed block hat. It's a, it's a big mm-hmm. pool, right? And and you have the transactions in there. Now you have this, this, this JPEG, this monkey JPEGs pushing transactions out, maybe, right? So that's kind of a problem because I want Bitcoin's economic a monetary, right, mm-hmm. things to have sort of a preference. Uh, maybe I'm crazy, yep. maybe it's stupid, but I kind of prefer that. And I'll probably fight for changes that, that make that be. Uh, it's just an intuition that that's a better thing. I don't have like a, a huge study on it. Sure. It's an axiom. It's a personal axiom. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I'm like, okay, great. So, but hang on a second. This is a pool, right, filled with water. And uh, we have all this economic transactions, like monetary transactions, they're denser. Yep. They're much mm-hmm. denser, right? Like it's a lot less bytes. Yeah, we'd call them their, their, their type one on the Bristol scale. There we go. And we got to the Bristol scale, which is for the people that don't know, is a, is a poop scale uh, of quality used by doctors in hospitals kind of thing. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say maybe only like maybe a lightning network channel open and close is really at that severe constipation Level. Yeah, no, it, lightning doesn't even get to close to constipation, right? Okay. Lightning is more like farts in this scale. So, so like seriously, like you're tra- you can because you can transact a million dollars, right? In like a, a atomically tiny amount of mm-hmm. of bytes, yeah, right? With a large transaction fee, and that's sort of like the rainbow or or like the gray scale of transactions, right? And I'm thinking to myself, well, all these JPEGs, their monetary value is likely, especially as we go forward in Bitcoin and Bitcoin goes up in price, they will be very low, right? It's like like a big balloon full of farts, right? Uh, and they, they rise to the top, uh, almost float out of the pool. So as we throw all these pebbles in, we fill up the pool with rocks, right? This very dense Bitcoin monetary transactions, we're floating all the stuff that's less important out by this beautiful method of the free market, the mempool market, right? And, and they get out, and now we have a block that might not even have JPEGs on them because they do have a lot of data that can't be separated, for now at least. And I hope it doesn't change. So, so then you move to the next block. So that was the next thing. And then, and then there is one more that I can't remember. I used to have many. <laughs> the other issue was okay, mempool. The mempool is very easy to get full of this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The, the mempool increasing size is not that big of a deal. If you have a problem with it, just kick the JPEGs out of a mempool. Miners already probably run altered mempools with larger, uh, larger size anyways, because they want to have probably more transaction options. So anyways, I, I try to attack this from every angle to be angry at it. And like my realization is there is parts of the blockchain now because somebody made a wave file of it. And you know what? Rejoice. Yep. Nothing we can do about it. Yeah, so much to say there. I think mainly it's that when, when you have a system that's as robust as Bitcoin, and then you just kind of look at how to use it right, First off, it's hard to even attack Bitcoin, right? Like, even, like you, you, it's really hard to attack Bitcoin. But then when you just want to use it and you try to use it carefully, you, you kind of either like leave it alone or make it stronger. It's very anti-fragile, very anti-fragile. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm, I'm going to throw a couple points kind of on both sides. So like one thing that's really nice about so, okay, on, on the point that MVK just said about you can kick things out of your mempool, I think that's a strategy that a lot of people are doing right now, and I think more people are going to do. I think you're going to see more diversity of mempool policy. There's folks who are running like the Ord Disrespector patch that just like kicks out all inscriptions. I think we might also start seeing other patches that apply other behavior to try to... Um, I'll say give preferential treatment to like purely financial transactions. Well, people want the the zero tra- the zero confirmation crap, right? Like a- yeah, well, uh, yeah, zero confirmation, one sat per v byte, 
you know, transactions. So I think one of the things that people should think about if you're going to be running patches like that is if your local mempool looks dramatically different than what minor mempools look like, it can actually cause you some trouble. Um, and th the root of most of that trouble is going to be around fee estimation, which if you're just doing like normal payments is like annoying, but Hey, now that we have, you know, mempool full RBF, like deployed across enough of the network, like you can fix that. I'd say the the bigger place where you might start feeling some pain in the next couple of years is going to be around various L2 protocols where you need something like you need to be able to make sure that you can get a lightning, uh, transaction mined in a particular amount of time. And if you have an inconsistent view of the mempool that's like wildly divergent from the rest of the network, then you might be signing yourself up for pain. Um, I think another thing that's like really interesting about the construction here in inscriptions is because it's all witness data, that data can be pruned. So if you're running a pruned node, you throw it away. If you IBD a pruned node right now, you download old witnesses from before the assume valid cliff, but then you throw them away. So there's actually like a draft PR in Bitcoin Core to not even download them. That's so no longer really... a full node. Well, so no, I, I, I mean, I, like, I listen, NVK, be careful. I got Matt O'Dell to admit on air that he doesn't run any full nodes. I know that was pretty funny. So I think the definitional things like that are tricky and very subtle. So you don't you don't want to get yourself in trouble there, NVK. Sorry, Rindell, you go. I'll, I'll use a different word. A, a validating node, a node that's validating all of the transactions in all of the blocks that it sees, right? So if, if you know, not everybody necessarily needs to have the whole history on disk from the Genesis block, but it's probably safer if you depend on Bitcoin economically to validate all the blocks that come in. And, um, you know, if, if we get some patches into Bitcoin Core that let you IBD without downloading a bunch of stuff that you're not actually looking at, could make it more accessible, which is kind of interesting. I think that SegWit, pre-SegWit nodes are going to be Bitcoin's 300 kilobyte uh, bunker coin. Yes. But hang on a second. So there is an interesting, uh, so I used to think, you know, like we're going to all have to do from Genesis, check all the transactions. And uh, what made me realize that that's idiotic is uh, the conversation I had about OpVault because we were talking yep. about Bitcoin in a thousand, five thousand years from now, right? And Bitcoin 5,000 years from now, if this thing is still running, I mean, you just simply can't do that, right? Like, one is going to be too much data to store, and then you're going to have the, the, the processing. Like, can you imagine 5,000 years of block data? It, it, it's crazy, right? I don't know. I mean, hard drive makers, they're going hard in the paint. They're going hard. They're keeping Moore's Law alive single-handedly, all right? But then I think it was uh, James, that, James that brought up that, like, the statistical yep. sort of safe point for this is like about 288 blocks is already good enough. So if you have about that much, you should be fine. I might, I could be getting him wrong. So don't quote me on that. Do you know what he based that number on? I can't remember. Well, so, so like a thing that James and like, I'm not going to put words in his mouth because he's not here. To tell me yeah, that no, I'm wrong. Let's not say it was James. Let's just say yeah, somebody. Sure. <laughs> Shout out to James. Absolute legend. Yeah, but 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 there there's a there's a uh, developer who looks suspiciously like James, who um, like one of the things that he's been working on so is handsome, um, but... yeah is is a thing called um, Assume UTXO, which is kind of like Assume Valid. So what Assume Valid does right is there's um, effectively like a checkpoint that's in Bitcoin Core source code, and anything that's older than that block, it doesn't do signature or witness validation. It like downloads them, but it doesn't do anything with it you still have to replay all of that to build your UTXO set. So what Assume UTXO would do is it would basically have like a checkpointed like UTXO set. And then if you wanted to, you could asynchronously in the background go and resync from Genesis to build up the UTXO set. But, you know, in the future, maybe maybe in 50 years or something, we're going to have something like UTXO and we're not even going to have a UTXO set as we know it. It'll be some cryptographic accumulator or something. So like, I don't think people are going to be building their their UTXO set from Genesis forever. Like that, that's not a thing that I don't think is going to survive for another hundred years. We need to, part of defeating uh, left curve maximalism is kind of just getting rid of a lot of these, just rising above a lot of really stupid discussions that people have wasted a lot of time on. And one of those is the philosophical definition of what a full node is. There are a variety of security trade-offs that you make in different scenarios, all the way from fully val validating archive node, all the way from 
bootstrapping from source with multiple uh, versions. There's a bit of a slippery slope on that. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm not, it's not, I'm just not interested in saying that there's like, I, I, I mean, like just people argue, somebody arguing that a prune, people are confused and they argue that a pruned node is not a full mm -hmm. node, right? And yeah, so no, that, that's, that's where dumb. people uh, fall on this philosophical side of the divide. So my point is just that there are a lot of very interesting trade-offs. Some of those involve not running a node at all, like that uh, open dime in like a disreputable bar. That's a sick fucking security trade-off, right? And yeah, so, no, totally. Like, and it's always yeah. been our sort of, you know, please be careful. <laughs> here's a here's a philosophical question for you two. Let's say you want Bunker Coin, okay? And the way that you get Bunker Coin is you run a, a pre-segwit node. And you transmit all the blocks and everything and maybe transactions to, I don't know how you do transactions, over ham radio. How does Bunker Coin get um, transactions to miners? Oh, so yeah, so you can do that via ham, yes. It's very easy. Like you can make uh, transaction relays. But but listen, when I talk about Bunker Coin, is it's unrealistic to mine on Bunker Coin. Uh, bunker by people who don't know what bunker coin is uh, this is a funny analogy uh, to my uh, uh, yearn for being able to do broadcasted blocks full blocks on short wave radio right uh, I always wanted that because that's fully decentralized it's like whole world coverage anyways for a variety of reasons uh, it's essentially makes it unstoppable but it's 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 unrealistic so one way that people have suggested to me that we resolve this conundrum is by doing sign block headers. Uh, I can't remember which uh, the name of the proposal was. What are sign was. block headers? So it, essentially, like you sign the the, the block header with uh, I think like a previous like hash or something like that. How? I, I can't. I, who signs it? <laughs> yeah, who signs it? You know, I I can't remember. I think Corallo okay. uh, had a proposal for this. Yeah, because he was in the the what's the name Stratum stuff. But anyways. There was a proposal for something like this. Uh, I remember thinking, like, you know what? Like, if I'm not sending full blocks, I'm not interested. Uh, <laughs> because, again, I don't want to trust signatures. Like, of stuff that somebody else is signing. But my point is, that boat has sailed. As much as it is uh -huh. fun for me to talk about my my bunker version of Bitcoin that we can, you know, do it on, on ham radio. What's wrong I, I, with bunker pre, pre segwit? Still too big. Yeah. Like you what can't if there's get, a lot of inscriptions? You can, Like, listen. The thing is, we've all decided Bitcoin is four megabytes per block. I accept that. I'm going to have to find some other way of transmitting this. What if there's 3.7 megs of inscriptions in a block? And so there's only 300 megs of like actual pre-segwit transaction data. Yeah, so you're going to have to prune it or you're going to have to yep. like filter it before it comes to my node, which kind of defeats the purpose. But what well, if you, so what if you want to run a pre-segwit node? You're sort of running in this degraded pre-soft fork model but you're still getting all the data well so, so the other problem right is, is that like you have to capacity plan for whatever the maximum is yes so e even if there's a lot of like if, if you wanted to actually do bunker coin you can't all of a sudden have the block that now doesn't fit over the radio mm. and now like you can't sync the chain anymore it has and plus yeah i mean like the way to do that in a in a trade-off sort of scenario is you have a node filter out all the crap and then that node that you trust sort of like then send like gives you a, like a, a, a smaller uh, chain for you to broadcast. What if people pay very, very high fees for transactions to get them into the first, and it kind of doesn't work, first 300 yeah. kilobytes of, yeah. No, because you're going to you're gonna end up with stuff that's not in your UTXO. So, yeah. so I mean, and NVK, like what's going to end up happening is we're going to have 300K blocks immediately after we get drive chain. Fuck drive so, chain. So, you know. That's when we're gonna have it. Fuck drive chain. Ryan Dahl, are you a drive chain enjoyer or respecter? No, I don't like drive chain, and drive chain is never going to happen. So I'm saying 300k blocks are gonna happen <laughs> right after we get drive. Just want to clarify, and also I love Paul Sports. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. I my, he's my really favorite. Cool. I had an interact. I was at. I was at. Uh, this is maybe this is like violating Chap Chapham House rules, but I was at a very very early Bitcoin conference with Paul Sports. Uh, the OGs will know why I call him that. And I told him some idea that I had at, at, at the conference. And he's like, oh, no, that's a terrible idea. And then I told him another idea. And he was like, oh, no, that's also a terrible idea. He was more eloquent than that. And then I told him another idea. And he was like, Casey, that is the, the most the terriblest idea that you've said yet. And so 
take a look at inscriptions and ordinals and like Paul Sports, how about them apples? All right. <laughs> <laughs> what a way of getting back at him. No, but you know, like it's the same with Jeremy, like Ruben, like love Jeremy, love Jeremy. Absolutely. These guys have quality galaxy brains, you know, it's Jeremy just that, might have the galaxiest brains. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's a whole different universe on that brain. It's just that like one is people are not going to be able to even get to the same level to comprehend yeah. the full whatever. One reason that I've been so like I really like to acknowledge that these people who I disagree with have personal qualities that I really love them. Many of them are close, close friends is that, you know, I'm, I'm all of a sudden have this crazy moderation burden and I don't want this to be Bitcoin's eternal September. It's not going to be. I want the shit coiners to come to us and I want them to assimilate into our culture. And that's not like a, that's, that's a bit of a personal goal. And so one kind of thing I'm realizing that these pithy statements have a lot of power. And so my, mm. my goal in terms of moderation is that we are going to moderate and deal with, um, projects and promoters and not people. You know, if, if you, if a project that has technical problems, I'm going to try to destroy it in the, uh, Mad Max free market, uh, with things like Teleburn. And people who have really gone hard in the paint um, promoting shit coins are going to be going to find themselves personally unwelcome. Well, no, they're they are going to be uh, unless they want to be a non uh, unwelcome in uh, in official project spaces. But that this doesn't have to do with a vendetta, with a personal vendetta or anything like that. This is basically just me saying, hey, like I think that I'm lucky to have built something which is accepted or at least a, <laughs> jovially ignored by a lot of Bitcoiners. And I feel lucky to, you know, be on that side of the fence. And I want to make clear for everybody where my side of the fence is. And if some, if something has a token that's not Bitcoin, I think it's confusing. And, and, and in some inscriptions are shit coins. And there are already some that are shit coins. And you can do things that make them less and more shit coiny. But I want everybody to like understand that this is not personal. My conversation, like, you know, just to use Paul, Paul, Paul Storks as an example, I love that guy. My conversations with him have been some of the funniest and most enlightening things. And I want to keep it all love. I want to enjoy a beer with him next time I see him at a conference. And I want to tell everybody they think drive chain is a terrible fucking idea due to incentives. And, uh, you know, that's where I really want to elevate things. And then we can all go from, being left curve maxis, some of us through a path of shit coinery all the way to being right curve maxis or like full down the galaxy brain meme maxis. I, I think th there is two things here that are kind of important to me. Uh, so one thing is intention. I do believe that like it, it's it's important to understand intention when people come up with projects, ideas or whatever. It, it all like it's it's very obvious when somebody's trying to make an intention of a pump and dump yep. versus somebody's trying to create a new piece of technology. Uh, that's why, like you know, I feel like never attacking you know drive chains on a personal level or anything like that. Same with Opsi TV. It's just that technically speaking, I I think the projects are non viable, but the ideas are amazing, and please keep on contributing them, right? Like, and then you know, <laughs> funny enough, with the drive chains, you know, I like to call it soft fork hell. Because that's essentially what it turns Bitcoin into. We we're just going to be soft forking like every other block forever. <laughs> it's, just, it's insanity. Yeah, it's like protocol level metadata in envelopes. Yeah, no, it's, it's terrible. Everybody wants to argue about their future. My shorthand for this is if we remember when Taproot Speedy Trial was going on and everybody had like the green square in their in their Twitter handle and like Marathon didn't signal and everybody like yelled at Marathon. That was like a bunch of, you know, politics and people yelling at miners. So drive chains gives you 256 slots for drive chains. And anytime there's there's side chain beef in any of those, which is going to be all the time, into, which is going to be all the time. It's going to be all the time. So anytime there's beef in any of those side chains, it becomes main chain political drama. And yeah. That's not even talking about incentive is another problems. Just, no. just the social, it breaks the social layer. Yeah. What, what do you guys think about, uh, on a technical level, what do you guys think about uh, Opsi TV? Super specific. So I, I really like it. I As soon as that conversation started, somebody posted a thing for, I think it was OptiX hash, which is like an easier to upgrade variant of CTV. Like the idea was that you have a bitmask that tells you which of the fields should be fixed. 
And on day one, it's the exact set that RCTV, but then it's easier to soft fork other permissible like bit mask values in the future. I like that because it's strictly like better. If we do nothing, it's exactly CTV. If otherwise it's more upgradable. I think that that's great. I think um, there's like a little bit of social consensus trouble with CTV because it's so broad that trying to convince people, here's the problem that's in front of you that CTV solves is a difficult product market fit kind of problem. But CTV on its own, I, I really appreciated that if you wanted to tackle from first principles, like how do I build the minimal, smallest, safest way of enabling these use cases, I think you would arrive at something that's indistinguishable from CTV. Like it's it's a very elegant design. Well, that's why I like OpVault. Yeah, I love OpVault. Yeah, I'm both sick. Because, you know, that's like sort of like, oh, ignore all the drama that happened in CTV. Yeah, we kind of get people to ignore on this use case that has social consensus, which is vaulting. Right. And, and then and then the vault stuff is sort of like, you know, it goes back to sort of like, oh, let's create this like very narrow use yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, and narrow uses have a higher chance of finding more consensus, you know, by yeah. definition. I think some kind of covenants are. Um, We're going to need it. Well, and oddly, I think that they're inevitable. Yes. I think that, um, you know, if you're designing a programming language or other language that you intend not to be Turing complete. And then you add a certain level of expressivity to it. And my mental model is that you need a way of jumping backwards and you need a way of branching. Yep. And then you try very hard to make this thing that isn't Turing complete or that you never intended to be Turing complete. And you accidentally add branching at one point and you accidentally add jumping backwards. And now it's Turing complete. <laughs> yeah. And we're seeing that with people going, oh, like APO, any prev out gets you rich covenants. And so maybe we should kind of take the design perspective that, you know, hey, we're going to add features to Bitcoin and, you know, they're going to be good. They're going to make it better and we're going to get covenants accidentally. And maybe we should do something that's very simple so that we can kind of provide a way that people can do it in a simple way. They don't have to waste cycles thinking about how to do it with some weird, you know, Rube Goldberg machine. And, you know, OptX is a fabulous future extensible way to do this simple, you know, simple use case. I think in some way, Jeremy is, um, and this is not talking about him personally, this is talking about his development strategy, honestly, like too nice about OpCTV. I was in a Bitcoin Council of Autists Twitter space and somebody asked like, hey, or somebody actually rudely asserted, you know, what about if this enables like Fed Fed whatever, Fed Bitcoin. And Jeremy was like, uh, like, can you tell me what you think? Like, what are you saying? Trying to understand this guy. And I think the <sighs> proper response in that Twitter space would be like, shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. It's never like Jeremy needs, you know, that, you know, the sketch where the Kean Peel sketch where Obama has his like feelings like translator. So Jeremy Ru Rubin needs that. And Shinobi can be his like feelings translator. That's right. Where like, Jeremy says things from on high and then Shinobi translates it, like just adds fuck you in appropriate places so that the plebs can like understand it. But well, Shinobi is a great uh, product champion, uh, you know, through, through like many years. But uh, I, I think it's, we would normally see things coming to Bitcoin when they become things that everybody wants, but people just can't agree on the implementation. Right. That's that's a much better place to be in. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. had no idea that you could do covenants on Bitcoin. And then I think a lot of people are starting to realize that they need covenants on Bitcoin. And then what's going to happen is everybody's going to start arguing about implementation of covenants. But hey, the hurdle of everybody agreeing that you need covenants is already sort of like it's, it's like it's getting there. Right. It, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that things don't make it in. It's a good thing that we're all fighting over. It should be that way. And in, in regards to the fungibility with the Fed being part of your transaction, that's just retarded because uh, you can do that with multi-sig already. Yeah, and multi-sig is much worse. Yeah, no, exactly. So you could say like, hey, this is, in order for you to have Bitcoin, the Fed is going to have to have a two or two with you. <laughs> you know, it's dumb. Yeah, right, exactly. You can also do it with multi-party ECDSA signature. So even if we were to fork out object multi-sig and get rid of Taproot and Segwit, and turn it all into, I don't know, grin or some shit, like you could still do it. Anyways, so so like I, I guess this was a big tangent, but uh, I think it's important for people to understand this dynamics. So guys, like going back to inscriptions, we, we talked about fee dynamic. Uh, we talk about like, you can't really kill ordinals, can you? Is there like, I mean, oh yeah, that's a good one to, to address it. I think the fact that ordinals was possible 
was essentially already happening in the Satoshi client, just nobody was looking at them. It's probably already there. People might be doing it, and we don't know. Yeah, and actually, one interesting thing is that um, the yeah, actually, you know, somebody published a Bitcoin talk post. They could have been trading ordinals back and forth between each other, and nobody would know. So how do we queue ordinals? For example, folks were talking about like uh, the the ordinals disrespector, right? One thing that is a problem there is you know like he wants to filter out the witnesses there, right? Yeah. So so if if you wanted to have a patch for your mempool policy that wouldn't relay inscription transactions, then I think you end up having the inverse of the full RBF conversation that we just had, right? So like That's right. There, was this, there was this whole debate about people are going to run mempool full RBF and some people really didn't like it. And I forgot who it was, but somebody, it might've been Peter Todd, somebody did the math and figured out that if something like 15% of the network- 10. About 10%. 10, okay, even better. If 10% of the network is running mempool full RBF, then there's enough paths to miners that you'll be able to, to relay a non-signaling replacement. And so I think you're going to have the inverse of you now need more than 90% of the network to run something like or disrespector. But then if miners decide that they really do want to be mining these because, you know, before inscriptions really popped off we had empty blocks we you know miners want to miners want to help people rip four meggers yeah they do um like they, they get paid for those four meggers and so um i think a worse thing to happen would be if the mempool was free of inscriptions but then miners each had their own like proprietary apis for you to submit four meggers to and now there's like a dark mempool that only miners yeah. see. Yeah. One technical note is that um, the, the 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 limit that requires you to rip a, a miner to rip a four megger is there for reasons that don't apply to inscription transactions. And so it's a really simple one line change to Bitcoin Core to raise that limit, add some kind of check that you know, hey, if all the inputs don't have any old signature types. If anybody wants to find it, it's in policy.cpp. Mm. <laughs> just just, just in case you're interested in that. Yeah. Be nice in official ORD spaces, but then also be extra nice in Bitcoin Core spaces. Yes. They are like the serious adults. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be a dick on the, on the mailing list and on, yeah. the, on the repo. Yeah, for sure. Maybe a good place to start would be with a Bitcoin dev post where you suggest it. IRC is a great place to ask. Yeah, IRC is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, don't bother Bitcoin wizards. This is not a Bitcoin wizards thing. This <laughs> is like get lost in spam somewhere. Just, re just remember, there's like appropriate channels for these things. Yeah, because people are busy. It's not that they're dicks. It's just like, you know, people have better shit to think about than your stupid idea. But this is a good idea, to be clear. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so here's the game theory on on uh, trying to filter out the ords, the, the inscriptions, right? The inscriptions. The inscriptions. So the problem with this is, is the incentives, right? Yes. The incentives are so that this, what do you want to call it, uh, the spam, Right, there is no spam in Bitcoin. Let's make that very clear. But I'm just going to use that right now. Let's say you want to filter out the spam. The problem is the spam has value, right? And it has a asymmetric value to a single person. So that person is going to find other people who also like that shit and are into it, and they're going to run the only node that doesn't kill inscriptions on Amazon, right? And they're going to have a monumentally large. Uh, mempool, and then they're gonna find that one miner that gets you know every fiftieth block, okay, mm -hmm. and they're gonna have an agreement. Hey, you know what? Like we're gonna overpay for these transactions if they if you get them in. This is exactly the same incentives that prevent the West from blocking out Russian 100%. Bitcoin transactions. 100%. It's the same idea. Yeah. You may have a small group of people that may be sort of like, uh, for whatever reasons, being tried to be kicked out of the Bitcoin network, right? They have exactly the same protections that you have to this remain is, uh, Eric, in- This is Eric Voskill territory. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and so what I would say, just, just to like, add some counterbalance to this argument. Cause, cause like, you're right. You know, the, the thing that anytime somebody says, well, what if the government tries to ban you from using Bitcoin? What we can say is like, well, mining is completely permissionless. If you can find cheap power, you can plug in an S9 event, you know, get enough people doing that. Eventually they'll find a block, hand them a, you know, put, tie a raw transaction to a pigeon and fly it to them. And like, you'll, you'll get into a block. 
So what this would do is it would raise the cost. That's it. Right? Like if, if you have to if you have to go through some special channel to put an inscription in, then maybe you'll have fewer inscriptions or maybe the inscriptions that get in have higher value. Now, the counter to that is one of the things that's really interesting about inscriptions compared to other NFTs on other networks is, you know, other NFT systems, you can push a button and mint 100 million NFTs with like one API call. With inscriptions, every single one occupies Prime. block space Prime. and and like it takes money. And so the fact that they consume a, a globally scarce value, Bitcoin block space actually like adds value to them. So it could be the case that if you're really, really successful getting 90% of the network to run or disrespector, and I now have to go through some other channel and pay a lot of money to get my inscription in, maybe that inscription is worth more because there's fewer of them. So it, it's still kind of... It's I don't know. Like So so my... B- because I am uh, I am sensitive to the fact that there is like enough DGENs in the world, if that's not the majority yeah. of the world, they will compete to themselves to get in and they're going to find ways of getting in. You know, like it could be that, you know, after the dense transactions, you're going to have this space on average right? There's mm-hmm. going to be available and there's going to be like space for like a couple of inscriptions per block, right? And then that's it. Like, it's just going to be expensive and only maybe, maybe you can say it's not democratic <laughs> to be in the Bitcoin Louvre, but, uh, you know, it's going to cost money. Maybe only Beyonce can, uh, um, can afford to put uh, her picture in a role there, but, uh, but it's not going away. Like, I, I do not see a way to kill this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, when when this first really popped off, like I, I did a couple of very early inscriptions just to play with it. And because I thought I could troll Casey, but he took it way better than I thought Wait, he would. Wait, why? What were you doing that were trying to troll me? Well, okay, so so inscription number one is a dick butt. And the story behind that was I saw that Casey made the very first inscription and like, I work on software. I figured Casey would be working on it and hitting refresh. And I thought it'd be really funny if he hit refresh <laughs> and then a dick butt popped up in his face. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I, I just wanted to create that moment of him being really confused. Like what, what bug in my code led to there being a dick butt? I wasn't confused at all. I know the internet. I was. I knew that the TTP was going to be low. I did not know how low. Yeah. Didn't know it was going to be that low. So when this first started popping off, like um, a, a thing I, I said to a lot of people is that the problem isn't that you can write arbitrary data to the chain. Like the problem is that I could get dick butt into the next block at one sat per V byte, right? Like if, if people are really, really mad about inscriptions, the solution here isn't actually technical. The solution is economic, right? Like if part of the reason why I'm not convinced that we need something like drive chains to pay for minor security is because if you do the napkin math on how many V bytes it takes to open a lightning channel, And if you buy the dream that in the future, everybody in the world is going to be using lightning, then you quickly come to the conclusion that there's not enough block space for everybody in the world to have non-custodial lightning. Like there's just not enough space on chain. So if there's actually real world usage of Bitcoin, like all of this stuff is going to get really expensive. We're going to have full four megabyte blocks because if there's no space and we're only making two megabyte blocks, people are going to get smarter about batching channel opens or batching better exchange withdrawals, or we're going to figure out semi-trusted coin pools or like whatever. So space is going to be full. And, you know, the, the thing that's going to end up happening is there will probably always be some high value inscriptions going into blocks. But what you're not going to see is the deluge of, you know, really cheap garbage because all that's going to be priced out. So like, I mean, you're going to price out dick butts. Although I will one counterpoint, one counterpoint is that, um, You know, when you make an inscription, it's very expensive, right? You got this big Mm -hmm. witness. It's like number nine on the Bristol scale, right? It's like not very economically dense. But if you are transferring an inscription, uh, those are intended to mostly be one of one taproot spends. Yep. Those are super cheap. And those get, so those get back to number one in a hurry. Yep. Yep. Well, so like I can see, I can see a future in, in which, Cases project like essentially halts, right? Best case scenario, honestly. I can I can see how the DJs are all running into this now because they want to get in a block, but then eventually you could have a complete or nearly complete scarce supply of block art. 
because it's just going to get pressed out completely. Especially, I mean, you know, once we have, because right now we have what, like maybe five, 10 million people using Bitcoin max. I mean, people love to inflate the numbers for the VCs, but like there might be like no more than five, 10 million people. So once we get to say 500 million people or a billion people using Lightning, those channels are going to be worth a fortune, right? So they're going to be able to pay some premium, premium money to take that block space. And that's not even talking about the, the dense, smaller transactions. It's very easy to see this essentially like halting. So maybe it goes away. Well, and like I think that people have said for, a, you know, since the inscription started popping off is like, why don't you just put the image in like, you know, pick your favorite blob store somewhere and then put a commitment to it in the blockchain. And, you know, like people do that already on other chains. People have done that on Bitcoin. And like, that's not what the market's demanding. Actually, Mike. The, so one, yeah, the market doesn't demand it. But two, I actually sort of go beyond that, which is that I think that selling somebody something that they plan to enjoy for a long time, and they might be willing to pay a yeah. lot of money, they need to be informed yep. consumers. And if you're selling something, and I'll just start calling things out by name, like, listen, if you're selling somebody something where they pay $1,000 for it, and it's sitting on IPFS, IPFS is crap, and they don't understand they don't understand that IPFS is a shitty version of BitTorrent yep. and that it depends on there being cedars for as long as they want to enjoy it. But I have the hash. Yeah. Therefore, I must have the data. It like doesn't matter. Yeah. You need to take personal responsibility for it. If you want to sell somebody a something that has a pointer to Arweave, they need to understand that Arweave is a shitcoin that is a stable, a stable shitcoin that's pegged to the cost of storage. And when the cost of storage goes above the cost of the shitcoin, uh, data starts getting lost on our weave. And so this kind of gets to the sort of personal responsibility thing that I, I don't care if the market demands shit on our weave. Uh, I'm not going to sell it to them because that is a, a precarious Rube Goldberg machine that will collapse spectacularly. And even if somebody wants me to send, sell them, you know, a gun to shoot themselves with, I'm not going to. And that's my responsibility. So like you could say that like all this this use case were already possible in Bitcoin, right? Anyone could have made mm -hmm. some version of NFTs on Bitcoin. And I, I, I believe Absolutely. I believe it wasn't done just because, you know, Bitcoin self-selects for people who are less interested in that problem. And we don't have a community of people who want to, to peddle scams. You know, you have the dot BTC people, you know, scamming Bitcoiners, like well, trying to scam. Bitcoin's name you have and then you have some of the smart contracts that are kind of interesting but like didn't happen because they're just sort of too complex or just don't do the things that they need to do like RGB or SK and all this stuff I find this to be uh, one of the most interesting things that happened in Bitcoin in a long time mostly because you can't kill it and uh, two because <laughs> it's filling up blocks so props props to you for that yeah, I mean, like, I think a couple things that are really interesting about the project, one of them is I think I'd really encourage people to go and like read the docs and read how it's built and understand it. Something that impressed me early on was that it is like one of the most Bitcoin-y projects that I think I've ever seen. It's like Bitcoin all the way down. It's a fractal of Bitcoin. Any level you view it, you zoom in and it's Bitcoin. I, I was in a, some Twitter. I mean, you hate shitcoin as much as I do. Absolutely. He might hate shitcoins more. More. I'm trying to go hard in the paint. All right, and still be nice about it. So, so there's a feature now that Casey and Rob just hacked in to generate an ETH burn address. And then I think what they're going to do, I saw this in a to-do list, is show that address on the inscription page. So they're encouraging people to go and burn their ETH NFTs and leave a pointer to the inscription. I'd like to shout out by name know. the first yeah. bored ape that uh, joined us in the Ordiverse, Blonde Juan. I believe somebody uh, hit the button on a half milli BAYC ape because they know he wants to be set free in Oranger Pastures. And uh, yeah, props to these early adopters of the exciting Teleburn technology. It, it, it really is like a needle exchange program for DGENs. Like we're, we're bringing them over to like a safer place and giving them a dime bag of sats to get them hooked. Like it's hilarious. One of the, the things that sort of like converted me... Uh, 
was uh, Rindell kindly because you know your cold for the wallet was there. I'm like I'm I'm with my travel computer. I'm like there is absolutely no fucking way I'm gonna run this guy's cold. So I'm like Rindell, can you do me the favor and and uh, put this put this in the in the chain for me? So uh, uh, inscription seventy seventy. Good number. Yeah, that's right. It was fantastic number. Rindell was actually putting them on Sats cards. Uh, was sending uh -huh. some Sats chips and uh, the idea with the Sats chip for us like was like okay how can i help artists sort of like create a certificate of their art right like real art like crypto graffiti makes amazing shit for mm -hmm. bitcoin right like how can i help him validate like how do you call do they have a word for that the origin of the art providence providence thank you so then i was thinking okay great so like i mean if the art is already in the in the in the chain no, we just we just need a cool way to to transfer that, right? And you know, having those keys on the cards are, are pretty cool features. Sats card inscriptions on Sats card is the most cyberpunk use case of. It's pretty crazy inscriptions. And, and you know, there, there's a there's a thing that I'm working on. So, Sats chip kind of our Sats chip already does this, but you can't really do it with taproot addresses in Bitcoin Core wallets is being able to sign a message or sign a challenge with the key that's holding, I'm doing air quotes right now, nobody can see, but holding a particular inscription. Can we pay you to implement BIP322? It's already in progress. It's, it's all this is happening for other reasons. <laughs> yeah, it's happening for other reasons. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for other reasons. But but what you're going to be able to do is say that you're, you know, like I buy a thing from Crypto Graffiti and I have like a physical piece, and then I also have this like digital certificate of authenticity. If I want to sell it to Casey and I want to do it over the internet, he wants to make sure he's not going to get scammed. The natural Bitcoin y thing to do is he sends me a thing that says, Hi, I'm Casey, I want to buy this. I sign it with my private key and I send it back to him. You can't really do that with descriptor wallets for technical reasons. So like we're we're gonna do it using BIP three two two. I would I would love to have that like we have a real hard need for some sort of verification. And I would love for that to happen first before like we just desperately roll our own in some stupid way. I think the idea of correct me if I'm wrong, BIP BIP three 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 is you basically create this transaction that Right. So, sorry, three, two, two. You create this dummy transaction that can never be valid, and then you add witnesses such that you prove that you could move it. It was designed for proof of reserves. Yep. And it was the correct way of doing proof of reserves. I'm super excited about this for code card for other reasons. I, I love that because um, a reveal transaction is actually a tap. It's a, a, a the, the, the the commit transaction output is a um, p to two r. Yeah, it's a pay to tap root, and there's a there is a key that's generated. And there is the script path, which, which signs with the same key and reveals the inscription. So if we want to prove that you have a pending commit in the mempool, we could do that you with 322. Yeah, or that you've made a commit, you have a UTX, your, a, a commit that's a UTXO, maybe even better. You can prove that you are able to reveal it and you prove what it reveals to, which is sick. And 322 lets you do that. Yeah, I mean, so so the way the way that this works, and like I need I need BIP 322 for like work stuff, so I'm implementing it anyway, and then like it'll be open source, and I'm gonna roll it into Ord. Incentives, it's amazing. It's amazing that the apes are paying for development on other things, right? Dude, I'm I'm here for it. So the way that it works is you make two transactions. Uh, one of them is called to spend, and one of them is called to sign. And the one that's to spend you pay from a non-existent transaction and you put the hash of the thing that you want to prove, like the, the message hash, into the witness and it pays to your script pub key and then you sign another transaction that spends that to an op return. And anybody can just like validate these two transactions and like you're good to go. And what's cool about it is since it's normal um, Bitcoin uh, transaction semantics, it even works for things like multi-sig. And you can use VCDSA. Like this is, has nothing to do with Schnorr. Like you can do all this stuff. You can stuff. do legacy. You can do witness script hash. You can do taproot. Like if it's a valid Bit I'm not going to add support for all of that because, like, I have a lot of other shit to do. But like, it, it'll all be stubbed out. By the way, this is pre-taproot. Oh, so so it goes back to like 2018. It's super old. Okay, so I think like once Ords have a phone wallet that does this shit like pretty, it's going to be absolutely insane. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, this thing is going to really take off. Now, guys, we, we talked for for quite some time here. Uh, we explored this quite a bit. It was a lot of fun. And uh, people may feel differently about this. Uh, people may come to hate it more. People may um, 
to to like it more. Any final thoughts, uh, Casey? No, no, we said it all. <laughs> we said it all. I'm trying to right now. My biggest priority is making sure that I do things in a way that is very Bitcoiny and forces shitcoin culture to assimilate to our culture. Run the nodes. And to strip the shitcoin culture out. And if you want to leave it behind, it's about projects and promoters, not people. So come join us. I'm a very waters warm kind of Bitcoiner. So yeah, let's fucking go. Thank you. Rindell. Yeah. Um, and Casey, if you got to drop, I'm going to like go on for a minute. But like a, a couple things, I think I would definitely encourage people to check out docs.ordinals.com. If the only thing that you've heard is what you've like read on Twitter or heard on a podcast, the docs aren't very long. They're very readable. And, you know, I think what you'll see is that it is a very well-designed, incredibly Bitcoin-y project, like fractally all the way down. You know, if you type ORD server, you get a full copy of the block explorer on your node. There are now dozens of, you know, telegram rooms and discord chats where people are who have never used anything beyond Electrum before are running Bitcoin full nodes and are transacting with each other in Bitcoin because they find value in Bitcoin. And like, that's a pretty amazing thing. I think there's two things beyond just money that have drawn people into crypto over the last two years. And those have been NFTs and stable coins. And I think I'd much rather have people get into NFTs and stable coins and then stay around for Bitcoin than have them go to shit coins and never come to Bitcoin in the first place. And then the last thing that I'll say is um, I think there's going to be a lot of ideas for changes to Bitcoin that could make it more difficult to do things like inscriptions. And what I'd recommend is that like the reason why people use Bitcoin for any particular reason is because it makes economic sense for them. So people are going to continue to use inscriptions until it doesn't make economic sense. And so either it needs to make more economic sense to do something else or it needs to make more economic sense to use Bitcoin for something else. And until that happens, we're going to have inscriptions on Bitcoin because that's how Bitcoin works. Yeah, I, I think the last thing just to add here is you increase the block size, you made your bed, now sleep in it. There is not much more to it. Uh, Bitcoin is uncensorable money and the shit that goes in there, if it's a valid transaction, is going to get in there. Same incentives that protect them and protect your money. So learn like me to cope and then learn to enjoy. Yep. Well, I got to say, uh, NVK and Reindahl is like the two genders. I fucking love it. Like going hard in the paint from both directions. It's good. <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you so much, man. Seriously, uh, this it was an absolute pleasure having you here. I appreciate the fact that you do this with responsibility. I know some people may not see it that way, but uh, it, I, they're still at seethe. They'll get to cope soon. No, you know? I, no I, I get it. Like I, I see it. Like you deeply care about Bitcoin. You worked on Bitcoin before. If you had not understood Bitcoin very deeply, you would have not been able to do this. So that shows. Definitely true. I mean, good luck with the project. And uh, yeah, this is fun. Cheers, guys. Yeah, I, let's do a round two, maybe in a few months, where everybody is like fully maybe they won't have gotten past cope but they'll they'll have gotten past seethe a little bit you know technical art stuff would be a very interesting the the art and the technology of art would be interesting conversation to have with the three of you the two of you i'm very curious to see how how this thing devolves in both the attack scenarios and like you know what kind of people try to inscribe there and you know people go don't go to jail uh you know like this thing is only starting i mean this 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 thing is gonna be very weird and uh and, and very interesting at the same time for until the fee market goes up and then maybe maybe we, we won't have this interesting thing anymore i, th I think it's super cool awesome guys this is great take care Thanks for listening. If you're new to the pod, make sure to listen to some very cool other episodes. Episode 15 about lightning, episode 11 about podcasting 2.0 and value for value. And we also had a hardware wallet security panel on episode five. Don't forget to follow at Bitcoin Review HQ or get in touch on Telegram, Bitcoin Review Pod or Bitcoin Review at CoinKite.com. We don't have a crystal ball, so let us know about your projects. Leave your boostagram on this episode and we'll try to read it on the next episode. We've added more people to the splits. Now, if you send us streaming sets, some of that go to opensets.org. 
and also to Citadel Dispatch with my guest, Odell. If you don't know much about Value for Value or Bitcoin Podcast 2.0, go to bitcoin.review slash v4v. Mm-hmm.